Is it going to explode? <clears throat> did you get married? That's did my I, question. Did I what? Get married. No. <laughs> no, I did not. 34 years old and married. I'm sorry? <laughs> thank you. So that's Somali to say thank you. Adam Mogan. Hello, Abdi. How are you? Your brother is now in Canada. Mm -hmm. Your mother is still in Somalia. Mm -hmm. And you correspond with her on a regular basis. But when you were there, it was dangerous to say that you were contacting someone in the United States. Is that still a problem? Uh, it is. It's always a problem. Um, well, I go to bed every night, waking up tomorrow, worrying about my family. Um, for my mother to have a son in the U.S. itself is, is a death sentence. You know, they could kill her for that. And taking the risk of publishing a memoir that's out there for everyone is also sort of adds up to that. So it's been, it's been quite a painful decision for me to really decide, do I really want to get out there or do I just want to go quite? Um, so that's why I have been waiting for five years now to become a citizen so that I can petition for them. Okay. And now the, the next process is, America's not going to take my mom until my mother becomes a refugee. So meaning she has to get out of Somalia. She to go to Kenya. Uh, Kenya has refused. They're not taking any more refugees. Wow. It's done, yeah. Wow. Ethiopia projected, so we're looking at other destinations. Huh. Okay. I really have no idea. She might end up going somewhere else. Um, I'm over here. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> How have you found America since you've gotten here? What's surprised you? America's complicated. <laughs> It really is. Um, <clears throat> you know, I live in Maine, that cold state. <laughs> and Maine is the second whitest and probably the oldest state. I mean, the population is pretty old. Um, I really have a feeling that the American dream is alive and that we have a bad leadership, but it's, it's the world that's getting confused more than me because I live with the Americans every day. I meet them, I talk to them, they read my book, so that's the, the side of America that I, I, I believe in. And that's what keeps my American dream going. Um, and it's also interesting that you ask that question because now that I am so excited to become a citizen and that I feel liberated, that I feel being participant, that I, I have a voice now since I can vote, that there are Americans who are renouncing their U.S. citizenship. So there's also that America that are tired of whatever they're tired of. Um, I'm sorry? The stolen elections. Well, well, we need to fight back. Yeah. Yeah. We, we're going to vote some people out, and we're going to vote some people in. So, yes. But I think, I, I'm not saying I disagree with someone to renounce their citizenship, but I really think if these people are stealing our elections, we don't have to leave them. Because this is a beautiful country and this is the idea of America. So if they take it and you run away, you're going to do whatever they want. And we, can't, we, can't, we cannot abandon this nation, this country. We can't. And I thought that Americans need to fight to the death for all the privileges and what we have in this country because I can't imagine where I need to go from here. This is it. To me, this is the dead end. I'm not going to go, as an, I'm, I don't want to be a Canadian citizen. <laughs> 34 years of my life, I'm tired. <laughs> I, I cannot be another refugee or I can't seek another asylum, this is it, and I was hoping in the future if I have kids, where are they going to leave? And this was home. Somalia is not a better place. So I have nothing else to fight for. Thank you. 
Hi. Hi. I was wondering, as I read your book, if you changed any names for protecting mm. people that you loved. If I changed any names for what? Well, like used pseudonyms so that you weren't outing people. Oh, in the book? Mm -hmm. Well, I, like my mom, my brother, and everybody else, their names have to be there. Um, because I want the world to know my mom. I'm tired of hiding things. We can't be invisible anymore. We need to be visible. I had taken enough risk of my life. Um, there were times I was a war correspondent in Somalia, and NPR had used a picture of me. But you're not going to see my face. You're going to see my back. So that's the life I've lived. And I want to be liberated. And I don't want to be scared anymore. I'm, I'm tired of it. Um, so, yeah, this, that could have put my family's life at risk. But I took this risk, and my mother does not have a permanent place now. So she keeps moving around. And I sponsor her financially, so wherever she goes, she could be there two weeks, and then she could be gone on the other end of the city for the other two weeks. That's, that's how she lives with my sister. They're all moving around. Um, so, yeah. Well, can you see them? Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. Oh, these students were interesting. <laughs> <laughs> nope, none of them fell asleep, so. <laughs> and they asked really good questions. Yeah, I think they were motivated by the little bit of I told them about my story. And the creative writing class that I spoke to was also really interesting because these are kids who want to write their stories. So I was sort of helping them do it. <laughs> right, yeah. Hi. Um, so first, thank you for your book. It has touched me deeply. I mm -hmm. has changed a lot my life after I, I read it. It was a very hard book to read, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it was very hard for many people in the audience, but thank you for sharing your story. Um, how has the Somali community here in the US uh, received your book? Have, they, have, you been, um, have people reached out to you? They wanted to talk to you about their stories as well? How mm -hmm. was that? Women stood up. The Somali women are the ones that have reached out to me, 98% of the people, because they, they have stories. They really have stories. And it's a, it's a male-dominant culture that I belong to. And I talk about it through the book. And I sort of, and I wasn't hoping this, but it, it became an eye-opening, and I would say empowering uh, other people to tell their stories. I, 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 like I said, in Somalia, I could have been killed for writing such a memoir because you're talking about things that people had done that they don't want the world to know. Um, but also, I, I had, you know, most of the grown-up religious Somali men are not okay with it. Like they, don't, they don't want us to really get all the frustrations, the issues that we have in the culture that need to come out, like FGM, female genital mutilation, or jail marriage, those kind of things which sort of exist in our cultures. So I took that courage, um, sort of like speaking openly about that, and it had really empowered young, educated Somali women in this country who have purchased the book, read it, and I was able, some of them have, have, been, have put together a few things that I went through, and I said I love it. So you might probably see several few other books that come out in the future. Um, so it's been, it's been widely received very, very well. Um, from Seattle to Minnesota to Ohio, that's the largest Somali base. And Maine has uh, also a growing, uh, growing Somali where I live. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really been going, going very well so far. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. How are you? I'm well. Good. I just wanted to publicly say thank you very much for taking this real casual journey across the country and then heading back 48 hours later. I really appreciate the fact that you're doing this. But I hung out with him yesterday. That was so yeah. awesome. Um, Thanks for just, just suggesting yeah. the chicken. Uh, what do you call it? 
It was good? It was Thanks. great. Okay, good. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, we talked yesterday about how I campaigned in 2008 the, about the diversity of this community, mm -hmm. how you have to treasure it, honor it, and, and it's really great. And your book is going to help do that. Are you planning to write another book? Uh, my other book's almost done. <laughs> I'm, I'm setting you up here. Go for it. <laughs> well, you know, my brother Hassan, you know him from the book, for those of you who read it. And you know that at the end, he gets rejected coming to the U.S. permanently by the U.S. State Department because of the travel ban. Somalia is one of those countries and the travel ban. So we fought. We fought back. I did not give up. Team Abdi, who you know from the book, turned into Team Hassan. And my brother is married, has kids, three kids. Um, actually, yes, three kids. Two, two of them are twins. And they have disability, you know issues and they were living in one room and they didn't have a future at all so we had to fight for them the process was long and difficult and complicated but thanks to everyone else who contributed you will read the next book I guess um, we were able to finally get him to Toronto in a very bad time cold and snowy <laughs> it snowed the day that he landed and he was like how do you live in this thing? <laughs> <laughs> and he and I walked, um, walked around Toronto. We just walked. And we, we call that the walk of freedom. Because we have never really walked peacefully like that before. So, um, and you know, what else do I do? I took him to Tim Hortons. <laughs> Since I know how the Dunkin' Donuts thing works, so I was able to give him some look at the menu and say, hot chocolate's really awesome. Do you want to order that? <laughs> You know, so I felt, I felt proud young brother. Hi, Abdi. Hello. Um, I'm one of those who read about your book and haven't had a chance to read it yet because we're passing it around, but now I'm going to go buy three copies for family members. Um, when I... Um, when I started working at a company, Intel, many years ago, they had the most diverse population that I'd ever worked in. Mm. And I grew up in the United States. I was born in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and the people at my company, when I would criticize my country, they would say, you just don't know how lucky you are. Mm -hmm. And they would tell me their stories. and. So my question to you is, if you ran the world, what would you recommend we do with our American children who don't appreciate all that they have? Can you imagine a way that we could help them understand your story? Uh, that's a really good question. I have been asked that, that many times. So I will tell you my individually what I do. Since I live in Maine, and it's one of the whitest states, and there are rural towns in Maine that the kids have never been exposed to or have never seen a refugee or an immigrant or someone else who really is different from them other than what they watch on the television, right? I hang out with them. I really do. And that helps, first of all, the being present there, showing them that just like them, you're a human being, but that you also respect the difference and that you hope that they also do the same thing, that accepting each other's difference is, is good. Like, I, if, I don't, if I don't eat pork, I don't have to, right? Um, and that helps mostly communicate with the kids, tell the stories one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. American kids also need to travel. It's, yeah, that, that, the, the problem I notice these days is even the immigrant kids who were born in this country are having a hard time connecting with the, you know, the homeland, the, the country where their parents belong to. And I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience, hanging out with young Somali kids who know who, um, they know who, um, you know, Michael Jordan is. Um, I, don't, I can't even name all these basketball players that they know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they know him. They can tell you who everyone in the Lakers is, but they cannot name three cities in Somalia. So it's, it's, it's quite a problem, mostly because they, you don't, they don't teach at schools where Somalia is, or what's out there, or what the geography looks like, or things like that. 
Um, so I think traveling, interaction, hanging out with each other, representation, where community members bring the other community members and getting together, sharing food, stories, might help, really. Um, will that let American children, the, the American kids born here, understand the struggles that these people can, went through? Sometimes they don't, unless they really pay attention to the stories. Um, we have just finished young adults version of my book so that under 18 have access to really dive into what a child in Somalia was like. In this case, my childhood stories. To, to, to give them a sense of what if this happens in the US? What if one day you become an immigrant yourself? What if you're displaced? That you cannot live in, in certain places and there's no government for you, what's gonna happen? So I hope that opens their eyes to like, maybe be prepared um, and learn from that and hope that nothing like that happens in this country. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> Yeah, my counselor told me that the childhood trauma is not gonna go anywhere. So it stays with you. That's what he said. So you're not, you're not going to recover from it. It will be there forever. And that's bad news. <laughs> but it's really, it's really bad news. Meaning you can't sleep well at night. Uh, I have panic attack and I'm assuming that most people who lived through the war feel the same thing. Um, you know how Majority of the Somali immigrants that came to the U.S., those who arrived, let's say, early 90s, are much luckier than I am, because they haven't really been there and had seen Al-Shabaab. I really hate to say this, and I'm not sure if there are kids in this room, but there were times Al-Shabaab took me to watch someone's hand cut off. So being there for that moment, no, that will never escape your mind. It will be there. It's super traumatizing. It's it, it wasn't even as painful as it is now when I was there. But now that I, I know I am here, I'm safe, so those memories kept coming back. So there's this panic attack at nights, you know, at times that give me this like heart palpitation kind of and um, confuse me and give, give me a feeling of like sort of dying. But usually it takes about five minutes and you come back from it. So I, yeah, I've received uh, quite some good advice. Um, bike ride, hiking, um, playing soccer as many times as you can. So in this case, when I'm in Maine, I do it every morning. I dedicate 5.30 to 7, just doing that. Um, going to the gym, you know, um, meeting people, hanging out, distracting yourself. But then my family back home, are also triggering all these memories because when I'm driving somewhere on the highway, let's say 90 or 95, and mom calls and it says, mom, it's super traumatizing. It just kills the moment. Whatever music that I was listening to or whatever podcast that was on or whatever book that I was listening to just don't make any sense anymore. And then I have to turn off the engine, get on the side of the street, and pick up the phone call. Usually bad news. Um, and I hate it because I told my mom, don't call me unless it's bad. <laughs> and I was trying to reduce the amount of calls, but <laughs> she hears a bomb and my sister's not around, she will call. And, you know, she, uh, and I pick up and I try to comfort her as much as I can. So, uh, yeah. I think it's, sure. Can you briefly talk about the current... Wait, where are you? I'm right up here. Oh, okay. Uh, can you briefly make a comment in regards to the current situation in Somalia? Yep. And also, uh, 
whether the current government is better than the previous government. The current government is much, much, much better than the previous government. Um, however, Al-Shabaab is in power. They run everything. Um, I send money to my mother, but it's Al-Shabaab that takes taxes from people. So we can live in, in that life. And, but also, I really hate to say this, but I have a feeling that I'm gonna, we are going to lose my country. Somalia is becoming um, 30 years of war, people are tired, so now people prefer to take Ethiopian citizenships or Kenyan citizenships. And Kenya sent its own army, taking advantage of this group of population that are more with them than with the Somalis. So in this, in this case, grabbing land and stealing you know, uh, parts of our country, and we don't really have a functioning government that fights for it. Like the other day, we had a huge debate where Kenya was trying to steal parts of our land. In this case, the sea. And then it, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, in, in Hague. Um, and then you know, they were told that you're wrong. So leave this, Somalia is a sovereign country. Um, so unfortunately, I, I don't really think there's peace in the air at all in the next few years. I, don't, I, don't, I do not see, because of the division, because of the tribal lines that we have now, um, in Somalia and all these uh, uh, power, ha power hungry people that are in, in the area, they're not even letting the government function at all. Um, so we, we, got, we got quite a way to go, I think. Uh, but the president that we have now travels in, uh, in a heavily guarded armored vehicle with the international army that are in, in there. Um, he's not gonna be able to walk around, meet the people. So we have got that kind of a government uh, which uh, I don't even know what they do when they wake up in the morning. I don't see much, much happening. Um, but I'll show up as a major problem. I think if it was gone, that other Somalis would come together. All right. Someone has a mic. Yeah, yeah. it's coming down. So yeah. First of all, thank you. I mean, I so absolutely enjoyed your book, and there was lots. There's. Um, a lot of little pieces that you did weave throughout that about gender inequality and just the, you know really severe conditions for women and I thought the part was so beautiful I mean really how you give so much respect for your mom and really point out I mean obviously the extreme difficulties for women and going and helping your sister during her pregnancy mm. um, so you know one of my questions is and having spent a, a little bit a fair bit of time in camps in Somaliland and just um, with with women, do you really think in any way that things can shift and change with the clan system and with the severe gender inequality and rigid gender norms that there are that are just uh, you know so that's how how the system you know works and so with you know 100% of men in power with women that don't have a voice but do 100% generally of the labor. How do, you, how do you see any kind of shift or transformation without any kind of gender, like a real you know, movement for gender, some kind of gender mm -hmm. equality? Somali men, men need to understand what they're doing. They really need to do. As long as we feel like this is how it works, that woman runs everything, the, she takes care of the children, um, and that man is not doing anything, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. And it, could, it needs to begin from within us. One thing I have seen lately is that Somali women stood up. They're becoming more powerful. They run for Congress here in the US. They're in there. So that's a, quite a signal to every other woman out there. Um, my sister pretty much has lost her future because she's not going to go to any school in any time. She was married at 14. I didn't agree. Um, I protested it, and I was told I'm an idiot, so whatever, you know. So now she's a mom. If I was her, if I was Nima, the woman, I wouldn't be here. I know. That's so funny. This is what I said to my friend coming in. I said, you know, whether you hear stories from, you know, the lost boys from Sudan, mm -hmm. all of those are all written by men because they could leave, right? It's their sisters who had to stay because they had to watch the cows while all of the men, you know, the brothers fled into the forest and lived, but their sisters all died. 
you know? Yes. I mean, yes. if, if you were a woman, you couldn't. I mean, I'm glad no. that you're here tonight. Mm -hmm. It's a gift, but it, you wouldn't be if you I, were a woman. And I understand that. So, I truly understand And I think it's that. beautiful because it does have to really start with the men, right? I mean, it has to be the men that do start it, and it does become a movement because you recognize and see that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying men have, you know, they don't have to write books, but they have to accept women. Not as the way we want them, but as that they can do anything that we can do. She can be in the army. She can be a president. She can be a prime minister. Let her th run things, because I think 100% they do the job in Somalia. When the wars happened, it was my mother who took us away from the wars and walked us hundreds of miles. What was that? He wondered himself. You know, to save his life and, of course, save our lives. But mom never gave up, and that's how strong they are. And I, I'm just shocked that men don't see that. They really don't. Or if they do, they ignore it. Um, so I think it, this, is, this is something that we within the community, we're debating, we're talking about it, and I don't see many men agreeing with me. I really don't. And it's, it's, uh, I'll it's just quite make one other comment here because what I've seen here in America and from Minnesota to here and to Salt Lake, other places that I've lived with the you know, um, population of Somali people mm -hmm. that came as refugees is that sometimes it's very difficult for the men because they lose their power here. I mean, it's so confusing and it's such a different culture. So they become much more rigid and they become, and it even is sometimes more difficult for their families because they don't want their wives and their children to become Americanized. And so sometimes perhaps if they didn't have, you know, they weren't necessarily abusive here, they just, it feels they become, you know, I've talked to some men, they feel very helpless and hopeless. And so there, it becomes an extreme situation in their families um, because they don't, they see these situations and they don't want, they don't know how to share power. And it's, it's a different culture and they're lost in it and they don't have a space to really talk about what does a different kind of masculinity look like mm -hmm. in a different way and how could we really actually see our women and daughters in a different, in a different way, in a different light. Mm -hmm. So I mean, 100 years ago, women could not vote in this country. So yeah, so we, 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 we crossed that line. Um, now we're in an era where women can do everything. And I think man has to see that doesn't matter where you come from, but if you believe in women being 50 and that you're 100, in this case, how we see women in Somalia is this is some, I don't even know where we came up, how we came up with this number. In Somalia where if your father dies and you have one daughter and one son, the son takes more than half of, you know, of the inheritance where the woman gets way less than that because she's a woman. So that's, that's you know, we need to come over, um, move on from that, debate these issues. Um, and it begins, I don't think it's gonna begin with men, but I, I really think women has to start this process. I wrote a letter to Ilhan and I met her and I said, I agree with so many things that you're doing, but you really need to look at this issue um, and have some women organizations going on and let's talk, write books, write articles, get the word out, you know, talk about um, equality, gender equality out there, um, which we, I, I think, we need to aim at the next generation, young Somalis rising up. They don't have to be like those other men in Somalia who will never change their mind based on what they believe in. Yeah. Um, Abdi, your book is incredible. It really... Um uh, impacted me very deeply, and I really thank you for writing it. Um, I was struck by many things. Um, I mean, it's an incredible tale of survival um, under long, uh, incredibly difficult situations, but I was also struck um, by your optimism hmm. and your perseverance. Um, I feel like... Um, Maybe all immigrants have that, but it was exceptional in the way that you didn't give up hope or that you encouraged your friends for 20 cents to, you know, <laughs> enter the lottery. Um, uh, so thank you for that. My question is, um, I also, you know, of course, one of the major th threads of your book is uh, talking about what it was like to grow up um, uh, in your faith uh, in Somalia and Kenya. I wonder how um, 
any thoughts that you might share about the differences you see about um, uh, being among a Muslim in America versus in Somalia? Mo being Muslim in America is more free than being Muslim in Somalia. I know you might be asking why. In the book, I mentioned times when I prayed at the mosque and Al-Shabaab closed all the exits. And without even asking our permission, they had to take down our names so that we could join them as an army. And then that's quite fearful. And I stopped going to that mosque. And there was times in Kenya when I went to the Friday prayers and a group of gang with machetes, it's also in the book, that came chasing me down, down the alley on my way to the mosque. And then again, I was fearful. If I survive this time, I'm not gonna survive again. So I was wind up in the apartment praying. Here in the US, I drive my car as beautiful as I could from Massachusetts through New York and I could start, stop at Rochester, Buffalo, anywhere. I could come all the way here. Nobody had to question my face, faith, sorry, to, to the mosque. The mosque is next to the church sometimes. The church is next to the temple sometimes. And it's the beauty of faith here. And I can freely and happily practice my faith here in this country. And I truly appreciate that and understand it all the time. Somalia is 100% Muslim. But at the same time, Al-Shabaab does not agree with me or doesn't agree with the Sufi sect or does not like if you are doing anything that they do not like. So it has never been that free to me. Um, and I really think I'm more in love with my faith now here than I was. And I believe that, and we really have some of the best Islamic scholars in this country. I follow all the news and you know they, they have uh, segments on, on, on certain television where they spread the, the, the peaceful word um, um, Islamic teachings really peacefully and it makes you love it and I sometimes go and hang out I, I, I see where they are and I can park my car on the other side of the street put in that thing for two hours go to the mosque and come out, and the only time I worry is when they give me a ticket or something. <laughs> so yes, um, if anybody disagrees with me, well, I mean, I'm only basing my observation in Somalia. If you're from Pakistan, that's another story. So my personal story is I'm more free here to practice my faith than anywhere else that I have lived in my life. Yeah. Yes. Hi, as I read your book, I felt really moved to want to do something to make a positive change. And of course, voting in the November election will be useful, but what else would you suggest that we as individual citizens can do to help the refugees or asylees that are in our community, in the US, or in the worldwide? <laughs> well, I know that's a lot. <laughs> so you, you, for those of you who read my book, um, you know how the Sharon McDonald and Gip Parrish, the people who took me into, into their house in Yarmouth, that interesting interaction we had, um, they have really helped me uh, very well understand America. They're pretty well educated. They showed me how the microwave works. <laughs> that first time when I put the ice cream in the microwave and left it for one hour. <laughs> or the other time when they put me behind the wheel and I crashed into their garage, a brand new garage. They did not kick me out. I'm still surprised they did not. I have done more damage than their own kids have done. And uh, they've been really tolerant. So basically the message is, um, be with them. Uh, I'm gonna tell you like, for instance, when I moved into this, into the house in Yarmouth, and it's, it's, a, it's a farmhouse, beautiful farmhouse. Sharon and Gib and Natalia, every one of them is white don't speak Somali, are not Muslims, um, and they have a dog, and there are cats, right, and there's a horse out there in the barn, there are chickens, you know, and so there were days I was, I could never come down from my room because the dog was sitting there, 
or at times I was traumatized and confused. But what they did was they realized those moments and came up and asked questions. Is there anything that I can do? Can I help? And then I would say, well, for now, can you drop me off at the mosque in Portland, Portland, Maine? And they would take me there. I hang out, smile, hang out with the community and get some Somali tea. And when I realized it's about time, I would text and they would drive 20 minutes back, pick me up, we go home. And the moment we go home, there's something to do in the house. How about chopping some wood out there? How about listening to some Harry Potter? You know, <laughs> on the thing. Or maybe how about just having a conversation where they would, they, so what I'm trying to say is basically they try to give me freedom. Say whatever you want to say, do whatever you want to do, feel like at home. You belong here. Feel like Morgan, who's the, who's the son, or Natalia, who's the daughter. Just do things, wake up. But it doesn't matter, if you blow up this microwave, we're gonna buy another one. <laughs> so that was very help, really helpful that they have never been pointing at me or angry at me. And now, five years later, I know how things run there. <laughs> I got into ice skating, I lead a few things, I've been to many places that they have never, so when we come around dinner table, we just talk. And in my heart, I'm home. I don't feel like I'm with other people. I feel like I'm with Medina, my mom. So I have changed. So that is one way you can definitely help with someone. If you stick with them, if you know one family that's your neighbor, Become friends with them. Sometimes it could be weird. Sometimes you feel like they're overwhelmed. They don't want to see you or that they're freaked out and scared because they don't know how to behave. Just allow them to do things. Allow them to be free, just like, just like your kids. Or have a good time with them. Show them that you guys can go to the movies together. Or maybe find out what they like and have your kids hang out with them. I think that's the only advice that I really have uh, and it helps very much. To, to be at peace at some point. And then from there it becomes really comfortable. Um, so I'm, I'm at a convert level now. Um, if your friend, if the immigrant or refugee that 